Speaker, of course we accept that these are issues and situations which are of utmost urgency and which require action, which do very often require intervention. What we say to you, however, on opposition today is firstly that the actor which does this must be legitimate, must have a modicum of information, and must be able to do so, must be able to intervene in a way which is effective and consistent with what is the best policy overall. And we say furthermore that we must never undertake an action which increases the number of vulnerable people who are put at risk by these organizations. So in, in, I will integrate your problem throughout my speech. The first thing that I want to talk to you about is the morality of these actions and allowing individual organizations to take these actions and to make these decisions on their, on their own. We say that when you give this funding, when you give these resources, things like weaponry, things like arms, communication systems, very important transport systems, very important things which terrorist organizations need in order to function. When you give those things to those organizations, you become a part of the you become a part and complicit in those in the actions in which they in which they partake. You become a direct part, a direct part of the, a link in the causal chain and the chain of causation which they use to oppress individuals. We say that that is, that is funding that they would not otherwise have without you consenting to giving them this. We say that furthermore, without that funding, without those resources, they simply will be less able to commit the types of atrocities that we all in this debate stand against and abhor. We think that furthermore, it was very interesting that the Prime Minister in this debate said, well, we're not talking about situations of genocide. But we think that's pretty interesting. It's a huge concession of the principle in this debate. Because we say that just because just because they're not directly killing people doesn't mean that we don't, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't also, it doesn't mean that they're allowed on proposition or should principally on proposition be okay with allowing themselves to become a part of the chain of causation in other lesser crimes. It's like saying genocide is a really bad crime and we should therefore treat it differently somehow. We don't see how morally it should be treated differently. We said that all types of oppression should, should, should be treated in a way that suggests that they are wrong and should not be con continued and proliferated by violence. He then tells you, well, it's different because you simply can't have a humanitarian corridor ever, or you can't have any type of intervention that would be effective. Well, in that case, the distinction that they should have made was one of efficacy, that you should only do it when it's effective, but that's not the distinction he's made. We're going to beat that one too, though, in a few minutes. Now I want to talk to you about why this reduces the access that you have to individuals and why it reduces and, and disimproves your bargaining position. No, thank you. So firstly, terrorists very often need this intervention. They very often need this aid to arrive to the people. So what, what we say is that in the status quo, very often they will be just willing to accept it without conditions in many situations. What you do, so why would that be? Firstly, because they rely on support for the communities who desperately need this aid, this aid right? Organizations like Hamas, like TTP in Pakistan, rely on the communities in which, in which they, in which they uh, operate to be able to live their day-to-day -day lives with some mon monicum of dignity, with some, 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 some ability to actually actualize in some sort of way. We think that it's really important that those groups, therefore, have buy-in within those communities for three primary reasons. Firstly, because if they're, if they're ones which are militant, which like to fight, we think it's important that they're able to recruit people. If they will only be able to recruit people if they can be shown to be doing good for the, for the communities which they claim to represent. Secondly, we think they claim a level of legitimacy. In order to have that legitimacy by sort of airing the grievance of that group, they need to have that group's support. If they're not able to provide them things, they, need, they, they, actually, they actually lose that support and, 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 and are undermined. Therefore, it's in their interest very often to accept this point without condition. No, thank you. And finally, they need private funding. In order to get that private funding, very often what you need is to be able to show that you have support of people on the ground at all. So, for example, if you look at city rebels, the groups which have proliferated the most have been the ones which have been able to get private funding from countries such as Qatar in order to make themselves in order to make themselves powerful, sufficiently powerful in the first place to get the rest of that funding. Therefore they will accept this funding very often without us needing to make such big concessions, right? However, without this without this buy-in they can't do all of that, right? So it's in their interest to accept that. No thank you. The proposition never let us ne never let us play that game because it's always had the incentive of a terrorist group to issue conditions and to make these offers and to force these offers to be conditional, to let us say. That means that in very, very often, in many cases, what we're going to have is a situation where we, have to, where, where, where we basically have to make concessions where we otherwise wouldn't if this wasn't the policy. It means that we cause harms and give weapons to groups which would otherwise never have asked for them because they really needed that support anyway. Now they have nothing to lose. Closing. Given that the West has supported the Khmer Rouge, the legitimate government of Cambodia for years, why do you think that legality is a good metric for deciding on who should get aid and who shouldn't? 
like we think that it's just not for individual organizations to decide, and I'm going to talk to that at length in just a few moments. But before that, we think that it's also important to note when he talks about suspicion among the terrorist groups, that he ignores suspicion among the communities to whom this aid goes. If you're giving, if, if these groups are already unpopular, and you're giving funding to the terrorist group which is, which, whose popularity is wavering there, what do you do? You, you, give, you increase the idea that this is Western stooges giving these guys money, and you increase the, you increase the idea that the West is a bad guy who's interfering in your business in a way which you don't want, which fundamentally undermines the overall effort there. Let's talk now about why humanitarian organizations are the wrong organizations to be allowed to make these individual decisions. Firstly, they don't have that much information in states, they don't have access to the types of intelligence and to the types of military information that, that states have. We think that lots of this information is secret, such as how, 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 what terrorist plans, what terrorist plans we know about, what operations we might be willing to launch against them, where the LTTR, LTTER, hiding their weapons and stuff in, in Sri Lanka, right? We think that secondly, it requires experts to have that information and to weigh it up properly in a way that NGOs simply very often don't have that, don't have that ability. Recognize that they're okay with letting all of these NGOs do that type of activity. Why, why is the state better at doing this? Firstly, because it is detached and it, better, it has more information, but secondly, also because it has legitimacy. It, it, takes, it takes into account more, it takes into account more interest than, than, than just those of an NGO which very often wants to be seen to be doing the most that it can be in order to compete with other NGOs for private funding, which is particularly important because it, dis, it, it disaligns their incentives with what we would want them to be. But furthermore, we think that it's especially likely to cause problems because very often, this, this, these types of actions, these types of hostage taking, or any other situation which is relevant to this debate, occurs in a situation where it, where it is convenient for that group to do so in order to get funding. So your group is nearing, is nearing the end, is nearing the end of its resources. The NGO isn't necessarily aware of this. The group then takes, uh, then takes hostages and is able, is able to demand, is able to demand some, some sort of effectively a ransom from NGOs, where it might be better to wait out that situation for a short period of time because we knew that the LTTE were running out of resources. We knew that the LTTE in Sri Lanka did not, were not going to be able to continue their oppression on people because they simply can't have the funding to do so. We think that had you implemented this policy, you would have given them a further lease of life with certain loss of further life and civilian life as a result. For those reasons, we're so proud to oppose.